Hi everyone, so today we're going to talk about um, actually designing with steel. So uh, a little while ago we talked about stress and strain, um, so we're just going to take a quick reminder about that. We talked it, about it mostly with axial stresses, so it'll be really good to kind of lead into that with steel. Um, and then what we're going to do is introduce the concept of bending stresses, or how do we take how we use axial strain and stress and make it work for us in bending. Um, and then we're going to actually look at how you design steel leaves and steel columns. Here's the thing though, the map is long and a bit of a pain, but I need to show it to you, I need to talk it out to you. You need to understand why those equations are what they are. You're not going to have to do the equations. You can imagine that if we have a standard list of steel beams that are available to us and steel columns that are available to us. If people checked those beams again and again and again at various lengths, you could imagine that pretty quickly you could generate a table for that. Um, and that's exactly what's happened. So after I show you where these equations come from, I'll show you basically a gazillion answers to those equations based on various parameters and you guys will be able to look those up. So we'll go through I'll show you where the math comes from, and then I'll show you how to look those things up. And then we'll do some actual examples where it'll be light on the math. We won't have to do the equations. We'll be able to look up um, the information, but there's still math even involved in that portion. But I, I've cut out you know, the really long, complicated equations, so it's just sticking to basic math. So you guys remember that we talked about stress and strain and the relationship between them. So stress is force divided by area. Strain is the change in length divided by the original length. And the relationship between those two things is the modulus of elasticity or stress divided by strain. And that's that straight portion of our stress strain curve, the slope of our uh, straight portion of our stress strain curve, where we're in the elastic zone. Um, hence why it's the modulus of elasticity, or E. Knowing all three of those equations, we can combine them and we can see here that we have um, force, area, change in length, and original length. So sorry about that guys, the camera just turned itself off randomly before it was slightly in my way and I moved it. And so my brand new camera already is super finicky and if you touch the cord while you're recording it just turns itself off. Uh, so you guys are going to have seen a weird hiccup there, I apologize, um, it, I hope it doesn't happen again. It happened once when I was testing out the system too. So. Um, you guys are familiar with the stress-strain curve of steel. Um, most of what we're talking about is in this zone right here. Because once we get to this point, we say our steel doesn't work anymore. There's a few times where we'll take it up to the ultimate strength. But mostly with steel, we say our steel stops working at this point right here, at 350 MPa, or 345 if we're talking about hot rolled sections. Um, and the reason we do that is we know that there's some capacity beyond that, but if we set this as our limit, we know that if we see large-scale deformations, oh great, our steel is about to fail, we should do something here. So this is our upper limit. We never want to go past that. That is our capacity. Now we know we have to reduce our capacity because we want to make sure our reduced capacity is greater than our factored load. But we've already figured out how to factor our loads and now we've got capacity, sort of. We've got to figure out how to kind of work with it. But we're starting to get somewhere that we can compare two things to make sure we have members that work. So the concept that we're going to talk about here is now taking axial stress and strain and how does it work for bending? Because we know that axial loads are just basically straight forces along um, uh, uh, neutral axes. Bending, bending, the best part of this is that Euler and Bernoulli, um, who were both polymaths in their own right, um, 
Euler kind of came up with all kinds of stuff with calculus, kind of a bit of a genius. The Bernini family was into everything, um, accounting, cal calculus, hydrology, energy. Um, and, you know, the Bernoulli family was huge. This is, this is actually the grandsons of the, ah, I forget the hierarchy. Um, anyway, they communicated in the 1700s and came up with a basic bean theory. Now, this is where it's really interesting. It starts with the premise that plane sections remain plane when you bend something. So the fisheye lens isn't doing us any favors here. Um, but this beam is straight and flat. When I bend it, you can see that the tops squish and the bottoms stretch, but right at the neutral axes, all of those lengths stay the same. So that length stayed the same, and that length stayed the same, and the line relative to it stayed at a 90 degree angle. You accumulate it and you get bending, but right at that tight locale, and this is where kind of a constant understanding of calculus helps, we're saying right at the neutral axes, it remains 90 degrees to each other, or plane sections remain plane to the neutral axes. Um, if you want, feel free to go look up more images of it. If you find it helpful, I've included a link to actually a Google search of images. If you want to go look at more images of things in bending with plane sections remaining plane, you might find it handy to just see kind of the plethora of people who've drawn the same thing I'm trying to explain to you. One of them might click for you. So, plane sections remain plane. You bend something, any plane relative to the neutral axes at the neutral axes remains plane. So, if it's remaining plane, but it's, it's, um, so it's remaining at a 90 degree angle to the neutral axes, but we know the neutral axes is, is, is we know that at the top it's squishing and the bottom it's stretching, something's happening here. So along the neutral axes, nothing is happening, but at the top, we're getting a change in length. And at the bottom, we're getting a change in length. So we are getting strain. We are getting some strain here, top and bottom. So if the plane sections are remaining plane and we're getting squashing top and bottom, the strain must be varying linearly. And you can see that that's the case. We're getting the same amount of squashing at the top that we're getting at the bottom with nothing at all happening along the neutral axes. In case it wasn't clear, the neutral axes is that center pink line. The relationship between stress and strain is now super handy as well. Because if the strain is varying linearly as it gets farther away from the neutral axes and stress and strain vary linearly to each other, then the stress must also be varying linearly as it moves away from the neutral axes. So we can draw what the stress looks like. So at the top, we have high stress, and at the bottom, we have high stress, where it's pulling, and at the top, it's squashing. Again, this looks exactly like what we intuitively know. At the top, it, you can imagine that that's where the worst stress is. And at the bottom, you can imagine that's where the worst stress is, but it's the exact opposite stress. And so this is a diagram of exactly that. And you can see we've illustrated stress here. Well, the stress we care about, anywhere kind of along that um, stress strain curve before it yields, we don't really care about. It works. Um, we want to know when we have to worry about it not working. So this stress here being our yield stress, if we say, if we hit our yield stress right here and right here, where it'll hit the extreme fibers first, that's what we really start to care about. So that means that if we have a rectangle in bending and it starts to yield at the extreme fibers, we have a stress strain profile that looks like this, where this is half of the depth and this is half of the depth. Don't forget, but this is looking at this side on. We still have our dimension B here, 
we're just not looking at it. It's in the page. So some, we're imagining that this is, you know, this is this cut. It's so hard to look at this because it's a weird reflection of it. We're making a cut kind of right along here. And that's what we're looking at is the internal stresses right along there. Now, what you guys don't have to do is draw the internal free body diagram of that and figure and sum the forces in the x and sum the forces in, in the y and sum the forces about the neutral axes to figure out what the internal forces actually look like there. But I can show you that we can do it. Now this is using a rectangle. It would be different depending on the shape. So this one is a rectangle. If you're interested in it, if you love math, feel free to go through and do this. Um, you can see that we've got our kind of dimension B there. Again, we've got our dimension B there, but don't worry about this. You don't have to do this calculation. Um, we had our yielding stress and our yielding stress hitting top and bottom. We know that we can change those stresses into an analogous point load. Um, we know that we have equal and opposite forces that balance each other out, summing our forces in X meaning we're just left with two moments causing rotation about the neutral axes. And we can actually figure out what those are, and then we can sum the forces uh, about the neutral axes and figure out what that moment is, all related to this stress right here. And for a rectangle, what we get is M equals stress times BD squared divided by 6. Again, not something you need to worry about exactly, but you need to know that we calculated all of this by just looking at what the internal stresses are. If this stress right here is the one we worry about, which is when is this thing going to yield or start to fail, that becomes our yield stress, Fy. Well, B is the width of our member, and D is the depth of our member. And in fact, we can even make it a little bit easier here. B and D and the square D divided by 6 was all about the shape, all about the cross-sectional shape of this element. What if we just took that whole chunk that was dependent on the shape of the beam we're talking about and gave it a name as a placeholder, you know, just say this has to do with the shape. So you can imagine S shape. We actually call it the section modulus. It's the elastic section modulus that really just has to do with the cross-sectional shape of our beam. So if we call that S, our internal moment of our beam at any point, at failure, what we're worried about is our yield stress times our section modulus, or our placeholder that is all about the cross-sectional shape of our beam. So again, you don't have to do this whole calculation, but I wanted to show you where it where it came from. The important thing for you is that the internal moments in the beam are equal to the stress times the section modulus or the, the, the shape property S. Um, and if this, if this stress is the one we worry about, which is the yield stress, we can actually start to do something with this equation now. Now, S, where I said is a property based on the cross-sectional area of the element, well, if we have a bunch of elements that are or shapes that we use again and again and again, you can imagine that we've probably calculated those again and again and again. And it's probably something we can look up. And it is. Do you remember those, um, uh, um, let me find it here. Let me see if I can bring it up for us. Get my mouse not doing something weird. Let's bring up. It's going to take me just a second, and you guys can't see what I'm doing. Let's bring up our, um, our shape properties, our steel sections. Bring this over to this uh, screen for you guys. And you can see, let's come to... You can see we've got S. Look at this, though. It's times 10 to the 3. It's a big number. It's hard to write. We don't want to write it all the time. But we can look up for different sections. So this is a W690 by 802, so a really heavy beam. We can look up that the section modulus S is 25 
25,700, but times 10 to the 3, so there's actually three more zeros after that, millimeters cubed. Now, when we did our axial stress, we could rearrange that equation. We could have P equals stress times area, um, but our stress equals force divided by area. Force is the load that we can calculate, and area was a, was a uh, property of the shape. So a cross-sectional area, the area of the cross-sectional area. Bending stress, stress equals moment divided by S. Well, moment is something that we can calculate as an applied load, and S is a placeholder that has to do with the shape. So these two equations look very similar. We've got the stress we're worried about, we've got the loads that are being applied, and we've got a placeholder that has to do with the cross-sectional shape of our object. So, so they, they look very, very similar. There's a few more units and a, and a few more decimal places involved in this one, but otherwise the concepts are the same. Now, steel is unique. If, if we were talking about wood or concrete, we'd more or less be stopping right there. But remember with our steel, that we yield. So um, if we go back, I'm just going to go back to our stress strain curve here for a second. What we're saying is that when we're bending it, we're starting to yield at the extreme fibers, so the top and the bottom, the extreme limits of our shape. We start to yield and we stop, and our shape would go back to its original shape. Well, We've gotten pretty good at analyzing these things and calculating these things and seeing what the risk factor is that with steel, because it's so ductile, we will let ourselves go just a tiny little bit further. We know that when the top and bottom yields, it doesn't mean it's failing because from the time it yields until the time it fails, a lot of stuff has to happen. Look, if this is how much it's deforming, look how much it can deform before it actually fails. So if we say that we'll let the top and bottom start to yield just a little bit, we'll let that yielding go all the way down to the neutral axes. So it can't take any more force, but it can start to yield. So instead of the yielding just being limited or the stress at yielding being limited to the top and bottom, we start to let that stress profile come all the way down to the neutral axis. So instead of being triangular, it's rectangular. Now, we can go through the exact same calculation that we did. The procedure's the same, except our analogous point load, instead of being two-thirds away from the neutral axis, it's only half away from the neutral axis. We can go through and do the same thing, and we get M equals stress, bd squared divided by 4. And this is for a rectangle, but we can do it for different shapes. Um, the only thing different between um, limiting our stress to yielding at the neutral axes versus limiting our stress, or limiting our stress um, at the extreme fibers versus the neutral axes is that it was bd squared divided by 6 versus bd squared divided by 4. What if we gave this new shape property a name? And we called it Z, and Z is the placeholder for plastic bending. They're the exact same thing, the exact same concept. It's just that because we have a ductile material with steel, we let it yield just a tiny little bit. Not too much. Um, we don't let it yield all the way through, but we stop just at the neutral axis. And at that point, we say we have failure. Now, depending on what members we have, we allow some to, we, we would say, we don't want this one to yield past the neutral axis. And some we say, we'll let it yield all the way to the neutral axis. Or, or we don't want some to pa yield past the extreme fibers, and some will, will let yield all the way to the neutral axis. How and why? That's beyond this course. Again, totally annoying, I know. Um, but what I can tell you is that sometimes we let it yield at the neutral axis, and sometimes we keep saying it backwards. Sometimes we only let it yield at the extreme fibers and sometimes we let it yield all the way down to the neutral axis 
and I would be very, very careful to tell you when and what you need to worry about. And in fact, you're not even doing the calculations, you're looking them up for different members, and that is actually already built into the calculation. But I need you to understand that sometimes we only let things yield starting at the extreme fibers because maybe we know that these aren't the best sections or the shapes are funny or there's something more to it. And so we let it yield when we hit our maximum stress top and bottom. And then some of them, because that maximum stress is just a yielding stress, we'll let it keep loading all the way down to the neutral axis. So everything looks the exact same, except our placeholder is now called Z for our shape property. Um, and we'll use, we can look that up as well. In fact, if we come over here, we can see that we had SX and we have ZX. And the only thing different is that ZX is a little bit bigger, meaning we'd be allowed to take on a little more load, or we'd be allowed to go to a slightly higher stress. It's not really a higher stress, it's more we get to take on more load. Okay, there's another part. Imagine if we took that even further. I know, you guys are thinking, what the frack is she talking about? Remember that whole thing about strain, that we let it move some amount? Well, the amount it rotates away is an angular strain measurement, and we can take that, those properties and we can plug it all in, and we can, I don't even show it here, but we can integrate, and then we can do some stuff with it, and we can integrate again, and what we would get out is yet another shape property. So again, we have area. We know we can calculate because it's a shape property. We have S, which is a shape property, and Z. And Z and S are interchangeable, depending on what we're doing. And now I'm telling you there's another shape property, I, we can calculate. And I, or moment of inertia, is all about calculating deflection. So I is all about shape. I just realized that I don't think I tell you anywhere that I is moment of inertia. And I'm going to just make sure that's blazingly clear on one of the slides because unfortunately Quercus doesn't let us use Greek symbols or anything but their font in answers so an I always looks like a capital L. So I actually have to write out what the name of the shape property is which is moment of inertia because a capital I doesn't register in any way shape or form. We can't do upper we can't do superscripts and um, uh, uh, subscripts as well. So I couldn't even put D BD cubed divided by 12 in a question or an answer for you guys because it wouldn't show up. You can put it in the question but not the answer. So again, beyond this course, we take angular strain, we would integrate, we would find the rotation at any point, and we'd integrate again, and then we can start to calculate deflection. So this happens to be for a uniformly distributed live load. So um, I just want to, pending strain, I want to remind you guys that this is for a UDL or a uniformly distributed live load. So there's different loading diagrams we can use. This is talking about one particular loading diagram. It happens to be the most popular loading diagram. But deflection would equal the actual deflection is 5 times the load, or the uniformly distributed load, times the length to the power of 4, divided by 384 E, which is the modulus of elasticity, which we know, and for steel it's 200,000 MPa, I, which is our, our moment of inertia, which is all about the shape. So, the same way for axial strain, our change in length equals PL divided by EA, or something about the force, something to do with the length, the property for modulus of elasticity, and something to do with the cross-sectional area, well, we have the same thing here. Our bending deflection, except ignore the constants because they're not doing much for us, we have a load, we have a length, 
we have our modulus of elasticity, and we have a shape property. So for both bending and deflection, we can calculate stuff if we know the original shape, and we know what the load is, and we know something about the material, and we know what cross-section. Well, the load, we know how to figure out what that is on a building. Um, we know from tributary area and tributary width, we can calculate loads. The length, we're setting that. We're designing this building. We're deciding how long these elements are. E, E is a property based on steel. We know it's 200,000 MPa. There's no surprises there. And I, or A, is a shape property. We're the ones picking what cross-sectional area we want to check or what shape we want to check to see if it works. Um, if you guys remember in the first, I think it was even in the first lecture, we had criteria given up to us about how much something could deflect. Well, this tells us how much it actually deflects. So now we can start to figure out, is our member strong enough and stiff enough? And look at this. For a rectangle, we can calculate any of these shape properties. BD cubed divided by 12, BD squared, BD squared divided by 6, and BD squared divided by 4. For a kind of more complex shape, we have some really complex equations here. We have them for all kinds of different shapes. But for most of the members we're going to talk about, we can actually look up I, S, and Z as we need them. And if you guys remember a few weeks ago when we talked about um, uh, actually figuring out what the, the shear and the moment were on different beam types, I gave you some beam loading diagrams. And if you look at these, you can see um, that we know how to figure out um, shear and moment and deflection. So here's that deflection calculation, 5 WL to the power of 4 divided by 384 EI. So here's a massive, massive takeaway for you. You remember how last week I told you that for sizing guidelines, we assume that depth and length have a linear relationship. And it's basically linear to load, too, that, that um, load and depth and length are all linearly related. Well, that is complete bullcrap. When we looked at, if we look at those equations for length, well, we know that the moment of um, a uniformly distributed load on a beam is WL squared divided by 8. Look, our length is squared. For deflection, we just calculated that deflection equals 5 WL to the power of 4 divided by 384 EI. Well, look at that. L is to the power of 4. That is by no means a linear relationship. That is a huge variation. So length has a really important part in our design. In fact, it's L squared for strength and L to the power of 4 for serviceability. Depth. Well, when we were looking, when we're looking at strength, um, BD squared divided by 6. And when we were looking at deflection, our moment of inertia, which is our shape property for deflection, is BD cubed divided by 12. So depth is squared for strength and cubed for serviceability. So this means if you want to make the biggest impact on your design, so if, if something doesn't work, shorten the span or deepen the beam or a combination of, the bo of both. And that is where you're going to get your biggest return. Making it wider, not going to have that big of an impact. Making it deeper, it's going to have a huge impact on your design. Or if you uh, lengthen the span or shallow the beam, you're going to have the most negative impact. So if you say, oh, I just want to extend this beam a meter, it's not a linear relationship to how much deeper your beam gets. It's going to have a drastic difference on that depth of that beam. So if you guys remember kind of way back, we talked about we wanted the load on our system to be less than the capacity. And in fact, we kind of fiddled with that. And we know that what we want 
is the factored load to be less than the reduced capacity. So we want to make sure we look at factored loads, which we've already done and talked about, and we want to make sure they're less than the reduced capacity. So how can we do that? Well, we know we can factor the loads and we've already done that. And I've talked about capacity now, but we want to talk about the reduced capacity. So for steel, our Fy, which is our yield stress. So instead of that funny little Greek symbol, we can actually write Fy. We know we use 350 MPa for cold rolled sections and 345 for hot rolled sections. Um, we know that our E is 200,000 MPa, and I gave you that G, something that you don't really use much, is 77,000 MPa. And here's the thing that you guys haven't learned yet, is our reduction factors. So for steel, for most of what we're going to do, our reduction factor is 0.9. So if we say that our yield stress is 345 MPa, we say that's great, but let's assume it's a little bit less. We're only going to take 90% of it. So let's look at tension design of an element. So now we can start to put all of these things together. So the tensile capacity or the tensile resistance of a member equals our reduction factor times our area times our yield stress. So this is an axial load. Remember, we had um, uh, we have uh, uh, um, stress equals force divided by area. That's just rearranged here where we've got force equals area times stress. And we're including our reduction factor in here. So this is the exact same formula we were looking at when we were talking about axial stress and strain. We've just added in our 0.9 material factor, our reduction factor, to make sure that we're saying to say it's about 90% as strong as we know it is. So that's great for something in tension. It's all about its stress capacity and its cross-sectional area. Columns a little bit harder. When we squash on a column, it wants to pop out sideways. But look, if I squash like this, that didn't happen. And I can really start to squash with a much harder force there. This, barely any load started to do anything. So what does that mean? That means there's something else at play here. Tension, we just looked at the capacity of the, uh, of, of the element or the stress capacity of it times its cross-sectional area. Our columns must have another component in it. And so that's this lovely, lovely equation here. You guys do not have to do this equation. I won't make you do this. We've got our reduction factor times our area times our yield stress. That's the exact same thing we had for our, um, for our tensile capacity of our element. But look at all of this. 1 plus lambda, 2n to the power of minus 1 divided by n. All kinds of crazy stuff. What I can tell you is that all of this is about buckling. And we basically give it a buckling factor. So if the element is really short, this is going to turn out to be 1. And all we care about is the tendency for this to squash. Oh, that would be amazing. Thank you. All we care about is the tendency for this to squash. As this gets taller and taller and taller and taller, you can see this lambda here has something to do with L in it. So the height of our column, as this gets longer, the easier it is for this to buckle. There is some load that will make this buckle. So when it's short, it's just squashing. And when it's tall, it's just buckling. And our final capacity is somewhere between those two. And at a certain point, we say, listen, even though squashing might be a part of it, we just find this thing too slender to even reasonably talk about it. Now, what are all of these other factors? N, don't worry about it. R, it's just another section property. It's basically how far out um, the extreme edges are. And we're not talking about the extreme fibers away from the neutral axes, but the extreme ones away from the centroid. You don't need to worry about it. 
K is how the top and bottom are connected. So most of the time, it's very simple. K is one, meaning our tendency to buckle is all about its length divided by some other shape property. I wanna show you one chart that talks about um, what moment connecting things does to a shape. So if I, ooh, if I just try to put a compressive load on this, you can see that this essentially tries to rotate out of my hands. You can see that we get what almost looks like a circle. It's not completely a circle, but you can see that it looks something like this shape here, C. And look at that, K is one, meaning our length is our length and we don't do anything with it. But look at this one here, look at this shape A. So this is saying that I won't let the top and bottom rotate and I try to squash this. Now this is where the foam is a little bit easier to bend than other things. But you can see that even when I put that load on it, I get a different shape profile. It's almost like this portion of the shape only happens here, or it tries to buckle over a shorter length. And that's really all our K factor is. It takes into effect, or takes into account that if we have different connections, top and bottom, we can change the shape profile or its tendency to buckle. We're only gonna talk about things with a K of one or things that their tendency to buckle is just directly related to their length. But I wanted to show you that because it's an interesting kind of thing to talk about. Now, what I did here is I charted the tendency for a column to buckle with load against length. So down here, when our column is really, really, really short, you can see that this line P is what load would it fail at if we squashed it? And this blue line is what load would it fail at if we only thought about the tendency to buckle? So ignore the fact that it might squash. Well, you can see over here, we would fail due to squashing. And the, the tendency to buckle is off the chart. As we come over here, this thing wants to buckle really easily. Like the load that it fails at, it shows that it's failing because it's buckling and squashing is somewhere up here. Well, what we do is combine these two. And so you can see that this red line is the compressive resistance of our column. Way over here when it's short, well, its compressive resistance is very similar to its squashing. Or, when it's short, it only wants to squash. Over here, when it's really tall, or its length is long, you can see our compressive resistance is almost the same as its tendency to buckle. So as it gets long, it's some combination of the two. Or it's, some, it's, it's, um, it's tendency to buckle is what's governing it. And then here in the middle, somewhere in that middle range, it's a combination, we say, all right, well, it kind of wants to squash and it kind of wants to buckle. So we'll take some combination of the two. And this line here, this red line, is that final equation that I showed you, or this CR equation. You can see that at KL divided by R greater than 200, we say, doesn't matter, even though it has some capacity, we don't trust it, we're gonna say zero. So this is where our KL over R went over 200. And we just say, after this, there is zero capacity in that column. So you cannot, with that shape, build a column greater than that height. It does not work with a zero load on it. It just doesn't work. That said, you can imagine that if I had a column, I could calculate CR here and CR here, and CR here, and CR here, and CR here. In fact, that's exactly what this Excel sheet is. What if somebody made you a table with all of those red dots written out on it? Which is exactly what people have done for all kinds of different charts. Here is one of them right here. We have, oh, I'm talking too much, my hands and face are going numb. Um, here we have a HSS 127 by 
So it's a 127 diameter, a five inch diameter HSS with um, a 3 8 inch wall or a 4.8 millimeter thick wall thickness. And we wanna know what the compressive resistance is or the capacity of this column is, our reduced capacity of this column, excuse me, sorry, is at 397, oh my God, 3,975 millimeters long. So our column is 3,975 millimeters tall. We want to know what the compress compressive resistance is. So you guys have given to you, I can pull it up here, you guys have a steel column table. It is 41 pages long, so the columns or the elements that we would use as columns, all of their capacities are listed here. So you can see that when the column is short, this is our capacity. And as it gets taller, it's got less and less capacity, all the way until a certain point where we say its capacity is zero. Doesn't matter, past this point, it's got no capacity whatsoever. Let's actually, oh, let's actually go to, ah, we'll do it from here. Okay, so we have our uh, HSS, we've gone to the page where we have our HSS 127, and it's got our 4.8, so our, our HSS 127 by 4.8 element right here. And we can see that if it's zero millimeters tall, thank you. If it's zero millimeters tall, um, it's got a capacity of, I can't see that, uh, 580 kilonewtons. Maybe we can. Um, let's maybe go to it. Let's find that page. Uh, let's see where we've got. Oh, look, I came up pretty close here. So, HSS 127 by 4.8. We can see at zero millimeters long, it's got 580 kilonewtons capacity. They asked us about 3,975 millimeters tall. So somewhere between 3,600 and 4,000 uh, millimeters tall, or four meters, pretty close to four meters. If we come over here, we can see that at 3.6 meters, it's got a capacity of 309 millimeters. And as it gets a little bit taller, it goes up to four meters. We've got 272 kilometers of capacity. So we're somewhere in between here. Um, there are notes at the beginning of these tables that you can vary linearly in between these. So I've talked to you before about calculating something where it varies linearly between two points. So we can look up our, uh, our table here. We've pulled up that at 3.6 millimeter or 3.6 meters tall, it's got a capacity of 309. And at four meters tall, it's got a capacity of 272. But we want to know one somewhere in between them. I can interpolate between those two things, and we've talked about that earlier in the, in the term. And we can calculate that the compressive resistance for an HSS 127 by 4.8, that is 3.975 meters tall, is 274.3 kilonewtons. So, if we had calculated that the load on this column was 300 kilonewtons, the factored load on this, kil it, on this column is 300 kilonewtons, does it work? No. We need our compressive resistance, or something with the little subscript R, needs to be greater than our factored load, or something with our little subscript F. And if our factored load is 300, that is not less than 274.3. We could make our column shorter. We could make it 3.6 meters tall, but that doesn't help us if our floor to floor height is 3.975 millimeters uh, or 3.975 meters tall. Um, what we might need to do is find a bigger column. Maybe we could look at um, the one beside it. We'd have to check, but it looks like 
the 127 by 6.4, so a thicker wall thickness, would be somewhere between 400 and 351. Well, even if it was four meters tall, all of a sudden it would work if, it was, if the factor load is 300 kilonewtons. So we know that we can look up what these compressive resistances are for things. So now we're going to break off and we're going to do an example. We're going to look at a, uh, a, an example building where we have a new canopy that's being built on an existing building. You know, they found people were standing in front of the door, getting wet as they were coming in and out, and this arena said, you know what, we want a new canopy there. It's a normal importance building, um, and we want to build this new canopy attached to the existing building. Um, the height of the canopy is four meters. Um, we've already figured out that the snow load is 1.44 kPa. So somebody's already done that for us for ULS. So they've already looked at what the, the snow, they've already looked up SS and SR and applied all of the factors to it and told us that the snow load is 1.44 kPa. And they've also said that for serviceability uh, questions, it is 1.3 kPa. So they've asked us, what size do we get for this column if we look at sizing guidelines? And then they've said, this architect has a very clear idea of what they want this canopy to be. Maybe they've already, uh, maybe they're trying to match interiors. They've said, does a W150 by 30 work for a column? They want that to be the column. And then they've also said, we acknowledge, though, that that's just our aesthetic. Um, so we want to know, um, is there an HSS that's smaller that would work for us as well? And then, you know, tell us kind of um, uh, which, which one you think, think might be more expensive. And so that's the task they set out for us. Okay, now we can start looking at the design of this element. Um, we have our, uh, our canopy laid out here, and we have all of our questions ready to go. Now, I personally find it handy to write out everything I know right at the beginning. So for me, I find it handy. I know we're designing our column now, so we're designing our column. I'm going to write out everything I know about this column what we know. We know that our height is 4 meters. We know that we have a snow load of 1.44 kPa or 1.30 KPA, depending on whether we were talking about ultimate limit states or serviceability limit states. Maybe that won't have much impact on our column design, but we should write it down because it's something we know. And we know we have a dead load of 0 0.76 KPA. The, the things they wanted us to do, size based on rule of thumb. using our sizing guidelines. Um, so the very first thing they wanted to know is how big does this need to be? Well, we know that the sizing guideline for a, a column, a steel column, is uh, WH divided by, um, uh, divided by 20. And we can calculate that out here, and we get 4,000 divided by 20, or 200. So that, to me, seems like um, an HSS, 203 by 203 by something. We don't know what, but a 203 by 203 HSS would be something really great to show on our preliminary set of drawings. 
Um, so that's what we would, that's what an architect would normally typically do. Um, and then the engineer would probably start to get involved. So the second thing they asked us was, does a W150 by, what did they ask? A W150 by 30 work. Well, to know that, we, we can look, look we know we can look up the capacity, capacity uh, but we need to know what the actual load on this is. Um, so to figure out the load, we need to know what the worst case factored load is, and we need to know what the tributary area loading the column is. So let's, sorry, I hit the, the wire there again. Let's take a look at this. Um, they gave us the loads on it, and we can see that our, 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 uh, either of these columns are picking up a quarter of this canopy. Um, so a half of six meters times half of five meters. So let's figure out what our factored loads are. Our, uni our, uh, our factored dead load alone would be our 1.4 times our 0 0.76. KPA um, and our factored dead plus snow. Now we could do that. We could look at the factored dead plus snow plus live and all of those companion loads, but there's no live load on this. So I think it's pretty fair to say I can rule out all of those possible combinations and just focus on these two. So uh, factored dead plus snow is 1.25 times 0.76 plus 1.5 times 1.44. Let's look at these in our calculator. We have 1.4 times 0.76 is 1.06 kPa, and 1.25 times um, 0.76 plus 1.5 times 1.44 equals 3.11 kPa. So which one's the worst case factored load? Yeah, that one right there. So we know which load we need to use, but now we need to figure out the column load. So let's figure out the column load. We know that the tributary area is going to be uh, 5 meters divided by 2 times 6 meters divided by 2. If you guys remember, we're picking up a quarter of this canopy on this column. So uh, 5 divided by 2 times 6 divided by 2 equals 7.5 meters squared. Because we're talking about our factored load, this load here is factored, we get to start saying CF, or our factored compressive load, is our tributary area of 7.5 meters squared times 3.11, so 7.5 times 3.11, equals 23.3 kilonewtons. So the compressive load on this column is 23.3 kilonewtons. We need a column that has a CR greater than CF. So CR must be greater 23.3 kilonewtons. So let's go look up some of those different values. Let's take a look at what we've got. We can go to our steel column tables. They've asked us explicitly about a W150 by 30. So let's go to those pages. Um, they've asked us about a 150 by 30. 
in the air. W150 by 30 for the compressive resistance. And look, here they've got the KL in millimeters. We know that we're talking about columns with a K of 1 or columns that are their exact length. We don't, we're not modifying how they bend by doing anything funny at, at the corners. So we can look at our W150 by 30, and we know that this column was four meters tall. If you remember, the height was four meters. So here we are right here. We come across. We can scroll in here, and we get that we, get, we have a CR that works, but it actually seems like it's pretty darn big. We get that a W150 by 30 has a CR for an L of 4 meters of 476 kilonewtons. Oops, sorry, I should make this bigger for you guys. So for a W150 uh, by 300, we get for us, we have a CR for a length of 4 meters of 476 kilonewtons. And yes, that is greater than our CF of 23.3 kilonewtons. In fact, I would say it was super duper bigger than it. It almost seems like there's a lot of extra waste there. That seems like a pretty darn tootin' big element. Um, I am going to just show you, do they have it right here in this chart here? Yeah, so you can see here that they give us the mass of this thing in pounds per foot, which is totally annoying. Um, well, no, sorry. We know that its mass is 30 kilograms per meter. Again, I'm doing it, I'm writing this on the, on the screen as small. So, we know because it's a W150 by 30, its mass is 30 kilograms per meter. Let's take a look and see if there is an HSS that works. What is the lightest HSS that works? Let's go back to those column tables and take a look here. So let's go... They asked us about a square HSS. So they asked us explicitly about a square HSS. So let's see where we are in our tables here. Let's get somewhere to our square HSSs. So this seems pretty good. Now we know we're only talking about something four meters tall. So we want a compressive load around four meters. And we want the lightest one that works. So at four meters, um, we've got, well, these all seem to work. Uh, four meters. We come along here. This looks like the, okay, so that worked. Oh, look at these ones. The two inch and the one and a half inch, they don't even have values for four meters. That looks like their KL over R is over 200, which means it doesn't matter what their capacity is, we would say those ones don't work. So let's take a look here. For our four meter long one, the first one that works is an HSS 64 by 64 by 3.2, has a CR, oh, sorry guys. So our HSS our HSS 64 by 64 by 3.2 has a CR of, what did we look up? We found that our CR was 45 kilonewtons. And that is bigger than our CF 
of 23.3 kilonewtons. Let's find out what the mass of that HSS is. Um, if we look it up, we find that the mass of that HSS is 3.91 kilograms per meter. So about a tenth of our W section. So it seems like we could go back to the client and say, you know what? I know aesthetically you want your W150 by 30. It works, there's no problem there, but you might wanna think about the HSS just because it seems to be about a tenth the cost or pretty darn close to a tenth the cost. Um, again, I don't know what your aesthetic reasons are for picking the W150 by 30, but I just wanted to give you some feedback. You know, I always maintain that it's not the engineer's job to say no, but it is the engineer's job to give some context. Um, you might have a very, the architect might have a very good reason why they picked a W150 by 30. I don't know what that is. I do know without knowing that information, I'm obligated to let them know that there's a much cheaper option. But now we know that for that column, we have an HSS 64 by 64. I usually like to put big check marks around it. Yay, we have something that works. Sometimes I might even put a big box around it. So if somebody came along after me and was looking at my notes, they'd be able to see quickly that this is the element that works. So now how do we calculate bending resistance? We figured out how to calculate compressive resistance. Now we want to do the same thing for bending resistance. Now you can imagine that the process is somewhat similar. You know, for axial loads, we had our cross-sectional area, our reduction factor, and our stress, and then something to do with buckling. Um, we know that when something is in, in bending, the top is in compression and the bottom is in tension, unless we bend it the other way. If a column in compression doesn't do great, um, it wants to buckle, you could imagine that might be something we have to worry about in bending as well. So again, the, these are not equations you have to calculate. You're going to be able to look these up. But if you have a beam in bending, let's maybe do it this way. It might be a little bit easier to do it in this way. If you have a beam in bending and we bend it, you can see that the top, it's trying to do it with, without when I don't want it to. So. I don't know if you could see it easily, what was happening there, but as I try to bend it, the top buckles, not the bottom, because compression is related to buckling, but tension isn't. So the bottom, which is in tension, doesn't try to buckle, but the top does. We tend to call that lateral torsional buckling. And like our columns, when the beam is short, it doesn't really have much of an impact on it. When it's long, it starts to have more of an impact. A reduction factor for bending is 0.9, the same as it was for compression and tension. Um, MU, is the buckle, MU is the buckling moment at the unsupported length. MY is the elastic moment with no... Actually, we're not even going to dig into this too much. What I really want you to see, and I think I have a slide that shows it all together, here's where we calculate the lateral buckling moment. So this would be similar to the critical buckling compressive load. What I really want you to see is that the process is the same. So you can see here that the, pur the purple line is the line when we don't care. So basically, if we tried to bend this, and it couldn't buckle. So we braced it all the way around the top. It can't buckle. There's no way this thing can buckle. If, um, if we have um, it unbraced as it gets longer and longer and longer, so you can see length doesn't matter when it's just about, when it's fully braced. As it gets longer and longer and longer, if it's not braced, or if we're talking about what load does it buckle at, as it's longer, as it gets longer, the load it buckles at drops down. So buckling starts to become a much bigger factor in what we have to worry about. And the combined moment resistance or the moment resistance of our steel beam, when it's short, 
is all about the fact that it's just regular old bending. And as it gets longer, buckling or lateral torsional buckling or the tendency of the top of the beam to want to pop out sideways starts to come more into play. You can see I'm not I'm not making it do that. It's 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 actually trying to do it on its own. And it doesn't matter if I switch sides, the top or the one that's in compression is always the one that has to buckle. Shear, we're not gonna worry about that much. Um, in steel, shear doesn't govern very often. Um, the shear capacity is kind of a part down the middle, if you wanna think about it that way. Um, there's um, kind of a, a distributed curve or its stress profile looks something like this. So this is the shear stress profile for the cross section of uh, an I-beam. You can see that having more moment up here or more uh, material up here doesn't do much for us. It looks like the sweet spot is what is right here. So this part down the middle, and in fact, even right here seems to be the best. Um, what we say is that forget the flanges, they're not doing much for us. You can see that, you know, they're, they're not really having that big of an impact. Um, the, the, uh, the part where we're worried about stress um, is in the middle here. We don't want to exceed that. So we're going to set our stress limit as two-thirds of Fy. So if that's Fy right here, we're going to set it at two-thirds of that, or 66.6 or 66.7% 66 of that. Um, and we're only going to use the area of the web as what resists shear. Um, shear, the relationship to capacity is linear to its area. Um, so it is very much like our compressive loads and we resist it all in the web. So bending all about the top and bottom. So bending this element and this element do the majority of the work. Shear right here in the middle does the majority of the work. You know, the middle and the middle is where it does the majority of the work. We don't need that much of it. So if we had had material here, it's not doing much for us. It's kind of wasted material. We could make use of it, but it's not as effective as this placement of steel. And that is why we end up with this shape profile. It's not the easiest profile to create. The rectangle is the easiest one to create. The reason we have this eye beam shape is that the top and the bottom are great for bending, and this bit down the middle is great for shear. Um, uh, there are different ratios depending on how narrow and how long the different elements are to each other. We're not going to spend any time doing that calculation. We might talk about it more when we get into wood, and we'll definitely think a little bit about shear when we talk about concrete. Um, but what I really want you to understand is that it's the web of the steel element that's doing the majority of the work for shear. So the total equation for bending and shear for a beam, um, this is the total equation for bending, and there's lower limits and upper limits on this equation. Um, the big thing to see here is that we've got our reduction factor and we've got a calculation of M. Um, and M is um, our regular ability to calculate a uh, moment, so the stress times um, uh, the section modulus. Uh, and shear is the reduction factor times the area of the web times FS, but FS is just 66% of our yield stress. So it doesn't matter how complex or weird the equation looks, pretty much it is reduction factor, stress, maybe it's reduced for some reason, section property. The section property varies depending on what it is. Um, and then if we're worried about buckling, we add a factor of some sort. So doesn't this look very similar to that lambda factor we had in, um, in our columns? When it was short, it was just one and we got to use its full capacity. But as it got longer and longer and longer, and this is our critical buckling moment, the ratio of that as it gets longer and longer and longer, we reduce the capacity of the element in bending. 
Uh, so the equations are shockingly similar, and they all follow the very same process. And we're going to see in wood that they look different, but really they're still just the exact same equations. But again, like we had with our columns, there are wonderful tables that we can look all of this up on. So somebody has gone through, and for each member, calculated the moment resistance at this point, and this point, and this point, and this point, and all the way as the beam gets longer and longer and longer and longer. Um, if you were in my graduate class, you would have to actually do that. You would have to do that calculation. I'd get you to set up a little spreadsheet and go through and calculate that capacity. You guys get to jump right to the tables. So here's the question. Why, why would I ever make them even calculate that if we can look it up in the tables? Um, as engineers, if a building is um, uh, using a different grade of steel, so say it's an old building um, and all we know is the grade of steel, we'll have to go through and do those calculations. What if it's um, a custom member that was made at some point? We wouldn't have these tables, we'd have to calculate it. Um, so there are all kinds of reasons why we would do this. Now, I'm going to give you a quick example here where they said, okay, um, our factored moment on a beam is 195 kilonewton meters. Um, its unbraced length is 3.45 meters. We want to know the lightest member that works. The reason we want the lightest is because lightest is cheapest. Remember, we're paying per tonnage of steel. So finding the lightest member is the smartest thing we could do. With all the other constraints met, lightest is what we want. Um, so we can go to our beam selection tables um, and we can look up, um, well, so I probably should have had this um, fly in here. I probably should have had this on uh, um, animations because what I just wanted you to see at first was the MF and LU. We know we want to find the lightest and cheapest. So if we look at our table and we look at somewhere around 3.5 meters long, so this was me just zeroing in on this portion of the table and looking at a section here. Look at all of these elements. Um, the W200 by 59 has an MR of 202. Well, that's greater than the 195. That works at an unbraced length of 3.5 meters. Um, the W250 by 58. 232, it works. Uh, W460 by 45 has 197. Oh, look at this, W310 by 52, it's shallower, um, and it has an MR of 224, so it works. And a W360 by 51 um, has an MR of 232, so it works. So when we have all kinds of members that work, how do we pick which one? The cheapest one is the one we want. And remember, this is where it's handy that the nomenclature for our W sections includes the weight. Because that tells us relative, it doesn't tell us what the cost is, but it tells us relatively to each other which one is more expensive. So if this W310 by 52 is 52 kilograms per meter, and this W360 by 45 is 45 kilograms per meter, Every meter of this beam is cheaper than every meter of this beam. So it looks like out of all of these ones that work, the cheapest one is the W360 by 45. There was more on the list, but it got more and more obvious that they weren't going to be the cheapest option. So the W460 by 45 is the lightest member that works. Now, they actually asked us for an LU of 3.45, and we looked up 3.5 meters. If I was kind of practicing, I'd be like, you know what, that's two inches longer. Longer is conservative. I'm going to write that down. But we want, to, we want to be explicit here. Let's interpolate, because if we look, we can see that um, we have the 3 meters and the 3.5 meters for our, uh, our W360 by 45, which is where? Ninety-seven, right? So it's right here. So our W three hundred and sixty by forty-five is right here. 
And at three meters, it has 217 uh, kilonewton meters of capacity. And at 3.5 meters, it has 1.97 uh, kilonewton meters for cap kilonewton meters capacity. Um, so we can interpolate between those two the same way we did for the column, and we would get that a W360 by 45 has an MR of LU for an LU of 3.45 meters of 199 kilonewtons per meter. So if our MF was 195, this member works. We have we finally have an answer. We know that for this beam that we probably figured out the load and did uh, method of sections or looked it up on a beam bending diagram uh, and figured out what the maximum moment was, the maximum factored moment, we can now find the cheapest beam that works. So now using that same building we talked about for our column, let's go through and calculate um, what our, uh, our beam needs to be for this new canopy they're putting in. So we, they want us to know what, they want to know what beam we need for right here. And they've given us a few criteria. They said, okay, well, what would we put on our preliminary drawings? What would we size it as based on rules of thumb? Um, and then they want to know, they have a very specific aesthetic that they want to talk about here. So they want to know, does W250 by 25 beam work? Um, and they said, assuming the joists don't lateral, laterally brace it. So this is interesting. This beam, when I bend it, it doesn't take much force for the top to try to pop out sideways. Now this is where if um, I was in front of you guys, I would have lugged this all the way downtown, looking like a weirdo on the via train and then on the subway. Um, and I would bend it and I would get someone to just not put any load, but just put their finger here. And I'm going to use my, I'm going to use my chin, um, as weird as it is. Um, and so you can see it tries to pop out sideways. I'm just going to put my chin here. Look at that. Look at how much more I can bend this. It does not take much load to stop that from buckling. In fact, it's about 2%. About 2% of the load that's causing the bending it takes about 2% to stop it from buckling. So very little load to make a thing stop buckling. Joists framed into the top of a beam are super good at bracing the top of a beam. So our normal unbraced length is the distance between two joists. Now, for some reason, and this is purely just as an exercise to show you something interesting, they've asked, what size is it if it is not laterally braced? And then we actually know joists do laterally brace the top cord of our beam in bending. So now does it work? And then they've said, well, we were given deflection criteria um, of L over 360 for snow and L over 240 for dead and snow. Remember, those are the criteria we talked about, I think, in our first lecture. We want to know, does this meet the deflection criteria as well? So we want to know about our strength and our stiffness. And then they said, okay, that's great. You've told us if it works or it doesn't. Is there a better laterally braced beam? So remember, our unbraced length would be the distance between the joists. And they said, remember, cheapest is everything. Then you could pick the shallower member. So if you have two that weigh the same, you, then you'd probably pick the shallower one because why would you take the bigger one? Even if they all weigh the same thing, you might as well get the benefit of headroom. So let's go through and do that calculation now. So now we can start doing the calculation for the beam. We want to start with um, recommending a size based on sizing guidelines. Then we want to check a W250 by 25 unbraced. Then we want to check a W250 by 25 laterally braced by the joists. We've got to remember to incorporate our deflection criteria and then we want to see if maybe there's a better beam that works for this. So let's start going through the calculations. We should probably figure out what all of our factored loads are. Well, before we did get that our worst case factored load 
was our dead and snow load case. And so we knew that it was 3.11 kPa. We calculated that in our column example. The loads on the roof haven't changed. We haven't figured out um, our serviceability dead and snow load case. Um, we do know that they gave us our dead load and our serviceability snow case. So that is our 0 0.76 plus our 1.3 kPa, or 0 0.76 plus 1.3, 2.06 kPa. And then we also needed our serviceability of snow all by itself, or, or 1.3 KPA. So those are all of the loads we needed. The first thing they asked was sizing guidelines. Now this particular element seems to be supporting joists, which leads us to believe that it, the good, a good choice to use for this beam design would be beam. That makes sense. It doesn't seem to be doing something extra special. It seems to be spanning from column to column uh, and only supporting joists. So the sizing guideline for B seems to be, for, for, for this beam, seems to be L for our, sorry, D equals L divided by 20. And that seems reasonable because it's picking up joists. We know that the length of our beam is 6 meters, and so we want to know what, what depth it needs to be for 6,000 divided by 20, or around 300 millimeters. So that tells us that a W310 is probably a good depth beam to be picking. So on our preliminary drawings, we would probably draw a W310 in the very first stages of this design. So the very next thing we want to check is, does a W250 by 25 work for an unbraced length of six meters. So we're assuming that those joists do not brace the top cord, which we know is bonkers, because of course they brace the top cord. This is purely an exercise to take a look at um, the implications of this. Well, before we can even do that, we need to know what the loads are on this beam. We need something to be able to compare it against. Well, this is where it's always handy to draw our free body diagram. We have a beam with some uniformly distributed load on it, WF. Now, we know the whole load on the roof was 3.1 kPa, but we want to know what what this is in kilonewtons per meter, looking at how much roof this is supporting. So if we take a look here, this, these, these beams are each picking up half of each of these joists. So its tributary width is half of 2.5 meters. Or sorry, half of 5 meters, or 2.5 meters. So 5 divided by 2 times our 3.11 kPa is going to be our line load. 5 divided by 2 is 2.5 times our load is going to give us 7.78 kilonewtons per meter. So that's handy, but we should also write out for dead plus snow and for for just snow by itself. 
I told you that this was a handy thing to get in the habit of doing because we're probably going to need those for our deflection calculations. So these are 2.5 times 2.06, the 2.06 coming from up here, the same tributary width, same tributary width here, but now times just the snow load, or 1.3. So 2.5 times 2.06, we get 5.15 kilonewtons per meter. And you guys don't really understand why we're doing this yet, but it's going to be clear as we start to go through this calculation. We get 3.25 kilonewtons per meter. We know that this is the one we want for strength, and we know that these are the ones we're going to want for deflection checks. Well, now that we have the one for strength, it's really important to figure out what our VF. Well, you guys remember our beam loading diagrams. If we bring these up, We know that for a simply supported beam with a uniformly distributed load on it, we know that shear is WL divided by 2. But we have a WF. So that means we get to figure out our factored shear here. And we know that our moment is the worst at the center, so MF will be WFL squared divided by 8. So let's start, oop, nuts. Let's start calculating that out. So our WF times L divided by 2 is 7.78 times our length and our beam here is 6 meters. 7.78 times 6 divided by 2 is 23.3 kilonewtons. Huh! Oddly enough, exactly the same load our column was supporting. Well, it makes sense that it is picking up half of what the beam is carrying and that reaction is the same as the shear at each end. So this makes a lot of sense. We know that MF is WF L squared divided by 8, or 7.78 times our 6 meters squared divided by 8. 7.78 times 6 squared divided by 8, or 35.0 kilonewton meters. So now at least we have something to compare against. But there's one other thing. There's this serviceability thing that we want to worry about. So we have the most common type of beam here, which is a uniformly distributed load on a simply supported beam. And the deflection is worst, so deflection max at center is 5 WL to the power of 4 divided by 384 EI. Or deflection equals 5 WL to the power of 4 384 EI. Um, I am going to rearrange this to be equal to I. It's the same equation, I'm just going to rearrange it here, and I'm going to write it out to be I equals 5 WL to the power of 4 384 E delta. Well, do you guys remember our different delta, our different deflection criteria? They gave it to us in the question. The deflection criteria for snow alone was length divided by 360. And our deflection criteria 
for dead plus snow was length divided by 240. So we can calculate both of these. 6,000 divided by 360 is 16.7 millimeters. And for dead and snow together is 6,000 divided by 240 or 25 millimeters. So under snow load alone, we don't want the beam to deflect more than 16.7 millimeters. And under dead and snow, we don't want it to deflect more than 25 millimeters. Well, we need to find out our I required. So what, def what I would make it work for snow load all by itself? So 5 times our W for snow load. We calculated, um, we calculated our line load right here as 3.25 kilonewtons per meter times our length, which is um, uh, in millimeters. So, so our I is in millimeters, so our length is going to be in millimeters. Actually, here's the thing. E is in MPA. Remember, 200,000 MPA. It's going to be easier if we keep everything else in newtons and millimeters to match our E. So why was our 3.25 kilonewtons per meter still 3.25? Well, you take 3.25 kilonewtons per meter and you make it newtons. You're going to multiply it by 1,000. But then to take the meters and make it millimeters, you're going to divide by 1,000. So 3.25 kilonewtons per meter is the same as 3.25 newtons per millimeter. So that stays the same. Our length needs to be written in millimeters, and that's to the power of 4 divided by 384 times E, which is 200,000 MPA, times our deflection criteria for just snow, which is 16.7 millimeters. We can plug this into our calculator, or 5 times 3.25 times 6,000 to the power of 4 divided by 384 divided by 200,000 divided by 16.7. And we get, um, did I plug something in wrong here? Nope, I plugged it in right. Um, Maybe I didn't, I'm out by some units. Let me just plug that in again. 5 times 3.25 times our 6,000 to the power of 4 divided by 384 divided by 200,000 divided by 16.7. That looks like a better number. That is a big number. If you can't see it, the decimal point is right there. Well, when I showed you all of the I's written, well, one, two, three, four, five, six. Let's write it kind of using some, uh, um, some scientific notation here. I am going to write it as 16.4 times 10 to the 6, acknowledging that I had one, two, three, four, five, six more decimal places there. And then I is in millimeters to the fourth. But there was two different deflection criteria we needed to match. Hey, do you want a coffee? Ooh, that would be fantastic, yeah. yes. We also needed to check our deflection criteria for dead plus snow. So there are actually two I requireds here. And for this one, we're using our dead plus snow criteria. So our load is 5.15. Our length hasn't changed. Our constant doesn't change. Our E doesn't change. But our deflection criteria does change as well. 
This is why I said you can't just pick the worst of the two deflection criteria, because look at this. 3.25 compared to 17.6, and 5.15 compared to 25. It is not obvious which one is going to govern until you do out the calculations. So let's plug this one in now. 5 times 5.15 times our 6,000 to the power of 4, divided by 384, divided by 200,000 MPa, divided by 25 millimeters, we get another pretty big number. But it's often easy to write these using um, scientific notation. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 17.3 times 10 to the 6 millimeters to the 4th. So we need our I or our moment of inertia, or the thing that talks about how much our beam moves, to be at least 16.4 times 10 to the 6, and 17.3 times 10 to the 6 millimeters. That's what we need. So we now need a beam, we need a beam that has a VR to be greater than our VF, which was 23.3 kilonewtons, an MR greater than our MF, which was 35 kilonewton meters, and an I greater than our I required, which is 17.3 times 10 to the 6 millimeters to the power of 4. So our member needs to meet all of those requirements. Now the first thing they asked us was, does a W250 by 25 when it has an LU of its full length, or 6 meters? Does that work? So not braced by our open web steel joists. So let's go to our steel beam tables. So if we come to our steel beam tables, you can see here we've got a column for VR, we've got a column for I, which is pretty handy, and we've got all kinds of columns for MR. It gives you various unbraced lengths here. So we can look up what we need. We know we're talking about an unbraced length of six meters here. They've asked us explicitly about a W250 by 25. So here we are, our W250 by 25. So W250 by 25, they, we can see that our VR is 321 kilonewtons. We can see that our IX is 34.2 times 10 to the 6 millimeters to the 4th. And then let's see what our MR is for 6 meters. MR is 20.4 kilonewton meters. So I'm just going to show you what I've written here. I just filled those those numbers in for our W250 by 25, we looked up our 321 kilonewtons, our 34.2 times 10 to the 6, and our 20.4 kilonewton, our 20.4, our 20.4 kilonewton meters. So that does not work. The other thing they asked us is, does it work if it is braced by the joists? So let's just take a look here uh, at what that would mean. Let's see what its unbraced length would be then. Let's come back and look at this. Oh, thank you. I've just been delivered a coffee. So if we take a look at this, not this. <laughs> if we take a look at this, 
we can see that our beam is spanning six meters and we've got one, two, three, four, five, six separate bracings. So we've got one, two, three, four, five spots where it's being braced. So six se separate unbraced segments. And they appear to all be at the same length. So our unbraced length is actually going to be six meters divided by six, or an unbraced length of one meter. So this is still our W250 by 25. Let's look at Let's look at our PDF um, for that same, our same um, beam. So it's still the same W250 by 25. VR is not dependent on length. I is not dependent on length. So both of those are gonna stay at 321 kilonewtons and our I is gonna stay at 34.2 times 10 to the six millimeters to the fourth. The thing that does change is MR. So our W250 by 25 for an unbraced length less than 1.5, we've got 95.3 kilonewton meters, or 95.3 kilonewton meters. So what we're saying here is Yes, or first, no, that beam does not work. But yes, this beam works. We have one that works now. So our, our 321 is greater than our 23.3. Our 95.3 is greater than our 35. And our 34.2 is greater than our 17.3. So we have a beam that works. It seems like all of these, they're, they're in the range, but maybe, maybe we could find a better beam. Let's try one more thing. Let's go back and look at that PDF. Let's go back and look and see if there's anything that works. Now, it looks like in our shear category, pretty much anything works. So it seems like shear doesn't need to be a big concern for us. So that leaves our moment and our I, or our moment of inertia I. Well, here's our category for moment of inertia. Let's take a look. Let's find a few that start working. Um, so none of these work for 17.3. Our W250 by 18 seems to work. Uh, Let's come over here and see for an unbraced length of one meter, our MR 53.4. That seems to work. Um, let's keep going. Uh, that doesn't, doesn't, that works. W200 by 21 works uh, for moment, shear, and um, deflection. But W200, even though it's shallower, it's heavier. That one's going to be 21 kilograms per meter, and this one's going to be 18 kilograms per meter. Seems like we've got a winner right here. We have, um, uh, we want to know, does a W250 by 18 work for us? Well, our VR equals uh, 247 kilonewtons, and that is greater than our VF of 23.3 kilonewtons. Um, our MR, let's just take a look here. Yeah, we were, we're good here. Our MR for uh, a W250 by 18, um, is 55.6 kilonewton meter, um, and we had an MF of 35.0 kilonewton meters. 
And the actual I for a W250 by 18 is 22.4 times 10 to the 6 millimeters to the power of 4. And that is greater than our I required. And our I required was 17.3 times 10 to the 6 millimeters to the power of 4. That looks like this, oh, sorry guys. I was just rewriting all of those things. So it's the same thing we've already written a bunch of times. You can see that our VF is less than our VR, our MF is less than our MR, and our I required is less than our I. So our factored loads are less than our reduced capacity and our required serviceability, or our actual serviceability is less than our required serviceability. So a W250 by 18 works. We would go to our client and say, you wanted to know if a W250 by 25 works, and it does. And if you were interested, a W250 by 18 is cheaper and also works. So now that we've done, um, I've shown you how the calculations can work to determine um, the, the tensile uh, capacity and the compressive capacity and the bending capacity and the shear capacity of different beams, and we can figure out how much they actually deflect. We now have the ability to know if uh, um, an element is strong enough and stiff enough to resist our loads. So the tips for, today, for this week Remember that plane sections remain plane, so strain is linear, so stress is linear. Um, that bending stress and strain are pretty darn similar to axial stress and strain. Um, depth and length, biggest impact on bending. That variable, those two variables can make your biggest changes in your capacity. Uh, tension resistance is just about stress, but at compressive resistance, we have to worry about buckling as well. Um, and if we have to worry about buckling, when it's short, we don't have to, but as it gets longer, we have to. Uh, bending resistance is similar. It's a combination of bending stress and lateral buckling. So when it's short, it's all about bending, and when it's long, it's all about buckling. Shear resistance is all about the stress in the web, or that small little bit in the middle. We know that we can calculate TF or CF based on the area of an element, we know that we can calculate MF and VF based on tributary width, loading, and looking at all kinds of different beam diagrams, and that we can look up TR, CR, MR, and VR, and the I required for a beam. That means we can size our columns and we can size our beams. Everybody, give yourselves a round of applause. We now have elements that work. We have now designed, and we can say, we sized something for a preliminary set for our rules of thumb, our sizing guidelines, but now these are the elements that work based on these loading conditions. And so now next week, we're going to start the same process talking about wood.